Hi, good evening, and welcome to the May 8th, 2023 City Council meeting. I will now call the meeting to order. Uh, Council Member Steele, can you give the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. Hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. City Clerk, will you please take roll? Yes, Council Member Kalmick. Here. Council Member Steele. Here. Council Member Landau. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Sistarsic. Here. And Mayor Moore. Here. All present. We'll move to approval of the agenda. By motion of the City Council, this is the time to notify the public of any changes to the agenda or rearrange the order of the agenda. Does anyone want to pull a consent calendar item? Mm -hmm. Okay, City Clerk, do you have any supplemental communications? Yes, Mayor, four supplemental communications were received. They've been distributed to the council and made available to the public. Thank you. I call for a motion to approve tonight's agenda. I'll move. Aye. Second. Okay, please vote. And motion carries. We'll move to presentations and recognitions to the Seal Beach Pickleball Association report. And I'll call upon Community Director Alexis Middle. Thank you, and good evening, Mayor and City Council. A little over a year ago, the city entered into a memorandum of understanding or an MOU with the Seal Beach Pickleball Association for the purposes of advancing the sport of pickleball at the Seal Beach Tennis and Pickleball Center. As is widely known, pickleball has really exploded around the nation and Seal Beach is certainly no exception. So this was an opportunity for the city to enter into um, a cooperative agreement with the Seal Beach Pickleball Association to expand the sport and provide additional services. The SBPA has been actively engaged at the Seal Beach Tennis and Pickleball Center, including holding events, league plays, fundraising and investment in the center. And when the city council approved the MOU last year, we promised to return to you about a year later and let you know how it was going. So this evening, I'm gonna turn the rest of the presentation over to Chris Vaught, who's president of the Seal Beach Pickleball Association, and he can update you on their activities this year. Thanks, Alexa. So my name is Chris Vaught. I've been a, a, a member of the Seal Beach Tennis Center and Pickleball Center for probably the last 15 years. So it's really exciting to actually see pickleball come and, and bring a whole new batch of people to the center. And it's been fun to just sort of see all the activity that's happening out there. So the first thing I wanna say is thank you to the city council for trusting the, uh, the association to take on the, the task of pickleball over at the center. So onward with the presentation. So one of the things that we were asked to do uh, was, was create more events, create more activities. And so over the last year, we've held five round robin events where we've drawn in participants from as far away as Santa Clarita. A lot of local people come in and play our events. Um, we've had three fundraising events, two nighttime fundraising events. And uh, we're, the proceeds, I'll get to it, the proceeds in a couple minutes. And then we have one offsite proceed uh, or one fundraising event. Also, we brought in leagues. Um, some of the membership that we've had have asked, hey, more competition, more opportunities to play. We have a lot of opportunity for drop-in play, but they wanted more, more competition, so we brought in league play out there. And then one of the fun things that we've done is, you know, pickleball is becoming a, a more national sport. There's a whole professional organization now. So we brought in last year, uh, Catherine Parento. She put on an all-day clinic for members of the association to come in, learn from the professional. So we had a, a lower level in the morning, higher level in the afternoon. So it was really a fantastic day. We're bringing her back in June. So if anybody's interested, come on out. We're having a, a it's a good time. Um, in general, what we've had is, and I think the number has even gotten higher now, we've had over 400 participants in our, uh, in our events over the last year. So it's really good. So we feel like we're really doing some, uh, bringing some strong events to the organization. 
Again, our, our, act, our events, our activities, we've had the team round robins, we had a Veterans Day team round robin, we've had fixed partner round robins, and then we've had uh, Women's Day League round robins where we continue to participate with, uh, with players from the community. Um, also as part of our, our charge is volunteer activities. So we've drawn in a number of opportunities. We've, we've brought in uh, uh, kids from the McAuliffe Middle School, taught them pickleball. We're trying to work more with Los, Alam Los Alamitos Unified to bring in more of the students, maybe the, 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 the teachers. I know we've hosted the city, the, the city's brought in the, the staff engagement team. We've hosted them for a day down there. We also, one of the things that I'm proud because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a veteran myself, and so we hosted our, our veterans uh, round robin back in November, and part of the proceeds from our round robin, we actually contributed to the, uh, the, organ uh, the uh, Women's Warriors organization. So pretty proud of that, pretty proud of the organization that we're putting, uh, putting forward. Um, we've participated in the Run Seal Beach, and Run Seal Beach has been also uh, uh, given back to it, we've applied for a grant, so that's part of our ongoing commitment to the city is back and forth committing to the participating in their event as well as uh, they are helping us with the, uh, the grants. Facility enhancements. One of the things that we were observing was that we knew that the city was stretched with budgets and not able to, to do all the enhancements that we thought we wanted to do. So that's part of the, the reason we went with the, uh, the organization was we said, hey, if we, if we have these events, then part of the proceeds from our events will drive them back into the facilities and drive them back into making improvements in the organization. So what we've done so far this to date is we've bought four tournament grade uh, pickleball nets for the courts out there. We've uh, brought in 16 new benches for all the pickleball courts. And then we just have an ongoing support. When the city came in and had the, 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 the contractor perform the uh, resurfacing of the court, one of our folks came out there with them and was trained on how to do crack repair. So that's part of our ongoing participation is maintenance of the courts. So we'll actually go out there and do minor crack repair to keep them, keep them upgraded as we go along. And, and the other thing we've done is just recently we put out a survey to the, to the complete membership. I think we're up to 268 members at the Pickleball, Associate, or the Pickleball organization. And we put out a survey saying, hey, where do we want to drive the funds next? And, and the, the, top, the top item that's been identified is, is ball, uh, a ball fences between the courts. So the bottom line is that we're trying to draw input from our membership so that we, so as they have events and they have participation, they have a say in where the money goes to. So that's kind of what it's all about. Uh, we are a 5013C, so we have a, a fairly formal uh, need to make sure we have good, good organization. Um, we have ongoing meetings with the city. Uh, the Parks and Rec Department to make sure that we understand what's important to them, what's important to us. Um, we've had ongoing membership meetings, three general meetings with our with our uh, um, with our with our membership, and then also we just maintain a, a good board structure. So we have a monthly meeting of our internal board, so we keep our our own operations and, and everything going forward, and, and trying to keep all of our uh, all of our documents correct. So. Again, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but mostly I just wanted to say thank you to the, the city. I thank you for being committed to the tennis center and the pickleball center. I know both the tennis folks, I'm still a tennis player, but the pickleball folks are, are happy with, with the commitment that y'all have made to the organization. And I just want to say thank you for your time and thank you for, for all your commitment to us. So thank you. I'll turn it back over to Alexa. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or, or comments that we could answer for the council? Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll move to the annual comprehensive financial report presentation and I'll call upon finance director, Barbara Arenado. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, um, Mayor, City Council members, Madam City Manager, City staff, and most importantly, our residents. I'm pleased to say that the annual comprehensive report is final. Um, on April 26th, uh, the city's audit subcommittee met with the independent auditor, auditor Francis Quo, partner with the Poon Group, to go over the city's financial position in greater detail. 
The Poon Group prepared the ACFR in accordance with the generally accepted accounting principles for government units, and staff also has submitted um, the ACFR to the Government Finance Officers Association for consideration for the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Kenneth Poon, Managing Partner and CEO of the Poon Group, the Independent Auditor, is here to present the report. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Good evening, Mayor, member of the City Council. Again, my name is Ken Poon. I'm the uh, managing partner of the firm. And sorry for uh, Frances not being here tonight because she needs to attend another conference. But I'm here to present the uh, audit results to you. So, um, so what we cover is a standard presentation after the audit. Uh, so there's a communication with those charged with governance where we de uh, determine the City Council is those charged with governance under the uh, professional standard. What we are going to cover tonight is a couple of things. Uh, our responsibility in accordance with the professional standard that we follow, uh, the required communications, and last but not least is the audit, uh, deliver our audit results to you. So a couple of things regarding our responsibility in accordance with professional standard. We are following two, two set of standards. One is the AICPA generally accepted auditing standard, and the second is the government auditing standard. Under both standards, we are, we are here to form and express our opinion to determine whether the financial statement are fairly present in all material respect in accordance with generally accepted accounting pr principle, which the government, governmental account, the government accounting standard board is the standard setting bodies for state local government. So uh, the city is here to abide by all those principles principles. Our responsibility is to plan and perform the audit to make sure, like to obtain reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance. So that's why we are uh, doing our, our sample on a test basis to make sure that these financial statements are free from material misstatement, whether due from fraud or errors. We consider internal control over financial reporting, but such, in, uh, such consideration is only to determine our audit procedures and not to provide an assurance on internal control. However, if we identify any material weaknesses or significant deficiency in internal control, it will be reported to you in a separate letter. Uh, last but not least, with the new standard, we need to also evaluate the city's ability to continue as a going concern to make sure that you have the ability to run your city in the next fiscal year. So required communications, uh, first thing first is about our independence. Uh, the city, besides we are the auditors for the city, we also do provide non-audit services to the city of uh, Seal Beach here, including uh, the preparation of the financial statement and then also the implementation of the new Gatsby pronouncement on leases. So those actually require a lot of effort from, from our end. Uh, a couple of the things we need to evaluate is the first, the city has uh, a someone that has the skill, knowledge, and experience to take responsibility of the financial statement, and then also oversee our, our services. And then also, as a firm perspective, we are required to go through uh, the safeguard to make sure that we are lowering our uh, threats to independence to an acceptable level. By doing so, we comply with all ethical requirements and we are independent from the, uh, from the city of uh, Seal Beach. It's very important because otherwise we won't be able to issue our audit opinion to you. Uh, significant accounting policy has been disclosed in note one to the financial statement. So it's a pretty couple pages of note talking about your policy and procedures. Uh, very importantly, this year, you have a one new Gatsby pronouncement has a significant impact to your financial statement, which is leases accounting, Gatsby 87. So the new lease accounting is an, uh, it's kind of um, eliminate the old methodology on uh, dividing the lease, uh, divided into operating lease versus capital lease. All these are treated the same, except for if it is like a, like a short term lease, which is a 12 months or less, you still run it through your income statement. But all of your leases longer than 12 months, so you, you're required to record it uh, on, your, on your balance sheet. So on both lessor and lessee side. So that therefore, you see a big significant change in current fiscal year because on the lessor side, you're recording a $10 million of lease receivable 
offset by the uh, def uh, 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 deferred inflow of resource relating to leases because the deferred inflow of resource of leases will be amortized over the uh, the life of the the leases and recognize those revenues so those are the big change on the on the um, financial statement um, under the current fiscal year um, also, U.S. GAAP, the generally accepted accounting principle, is required us uh, require the city to record estimate on these financial statement. Couple things: one, investment, uh, the investment fair value. So we need to mark the the, the investment to the market. Uh, second, depreciation on capital asset. The estimate useful life of the asset are pretty much an estimate. Pension and OPAT liability is purely an estimate determined by the actuary so on the pension side it's a um it's done by calpers and a net opap opap liability you have an outside actuarial study to determine the liability on as of june 30 2022 also a couple sensitive disclosure note one as i said is the accounting policy so it's pretty much i highly recommend you read through that note nine nine and number Note 9 and Note 10 is relating to pension and other post-employment benefit plan. Uh, that disclose a lot of the assumption being used by your actuary. So those are included in the, uh, in the financial statement. And Note 13 is indiv individual fund disclosure. There are some uh, fund that has a deficit fund balance. So uh, that does uh, require your attention to it. Uh, we do not have any uncorrected misstatement. All the, uh, all the things that we noted during our audit and then also the client's post the uh, the um, audit adjusting journal entry to make sure that your financial statement are free from material misstatement. Um, once in a while, the city may go out to seek second opinion on accounting treatment, but to the best of our knowledge and management inform us there's no such consultation. Uh, we encounter no significant difficulties and then also we do not have any disagreement with management in terms of accounting treatment or audit procedures that we perform. Last but not least is to deliver our audit results. Uh, happy to say that the financial statement are fairly presented, so we issue an unmodified opinion, which states that the financial statement are fairly presented in all material respect, significant accounting policy have been consistently applied, the estimates are reasonable, and the disclosure are properly reflected in the financial statement. Also, very good things that the city doesn't have any internal control issue. We do not have any um, notation on material weaknesses on internal control or significant de deficiency in internal control. So basically, it's pretty run pretty smoothly. So we are happy to, to, to say that there's no findings for the current fiscal year. So that's conclude my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Do we have any council questions? Um, <clears throat> yes. Okay, so um, I had a little trouble hearing you, but I just want to confirm that the um, the only significant change um, to updating um, the up uh, updates to the accounting standards was the um, GASB uh, eighty seven. Correct. So that was the only significant one. That's correct. Okay, and um, are there any upcoming? Uh, updates or yes uh, in the upcoming year uh it's kind of following the same concept with lease accounting uh there's a, a uh, statement number 96 on subscription based information technology arrangement which the city has quite a bit of subscription so we'll work with your it department finance department to determine the number of contracts that you have it's the pretty much the same concept as, as leases because once you sign the uh, the subscription agreement, you have a liability on your face of a financial statement. So we we at, similar to leases, we also capturing the uh, subscription asset, amortizing over the life of the uh, subscription uh, term. And that'll go into effect in twenty twenty three. Okay. <clears throat> um, also, can you provide any additional insights or recommendations based on the financial report uh, that could help the city improve its uh, financial or finance financial performance? Sure, that's a pretty broad questions here, and it's a really really good questions. A couple of the things that I would like to to note uh, because of the inflation. 
Um, the city is pretty much the, the the revenue are pretty stable. So in in order to catch up with the uh, with the inflation, you got to increase your revenue. Um, the other thing is uh, we have to deal with the uh, CalPERS, uh, the investment loss in the um, in in last year. So um, expecting the uh, contribution rate will go up too. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Nope. I'd, a few. When you did, when you talk about the test uh, sample, I guess what? How much do you look at? Well, depending on the uh, the the different opinion units, we we look at a lot of things in the general fund. Uh, look at a lot of things in the uh, water and sewer fund because those are major fund in the uh, in the. Um, um, as the whole entire operations, but we have to test all the like a lot to to get our comfort level. Couple of the things what we do is uh, risk assessment. So uh, we do tests of internal control over a couple areas, like including the uh, the payroll, including the water and sewer revenue, because those are a lot of different small number and a lot of transactions. We got to rely on your internal control. Some of the um, samples what we do is confirmation long-term debt um those we actually send out confirmation to your trustee to confirm the uh, the balances to make sure that the balance on the on the books are correct how do you pick what you look at is it just like a 10 percent of the uh we look at um there's a calculation uh, based on our professional standard. The city of Seal Beach we consider as a low risk oddity, so our our threshold was a little little bit higher. So we we have a calculation on determining the uh, individual significant item, the number, so that we select samples above that number to, for for our testing. Okay. And the, when when you talk about the gas eighty seven lease, mm -hmm. uh, can you give an example? of cell tower so cell, uh, cell tower lease so the oh, the, okay. the uh, communication company wanting to put a cell tower on your piece of land usually is a long term so you need to capture the uh, the long term like the whole entire lease term recording it as a lease receivable and then also recording as a deferred infl uh, inflow the resource because you're not recognizing the revenue um, un, 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 until it is being earned. So it's pretty much amortized over the lease term. Same thing on the less seaside, um, you are, are leasing a equipment. So um, if, if you are leasing an equipment, but that, that number is relatively small compared to the uh, lease receivable side. Okay. All right, thank you very much. You're Any welcome. other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to oral communications. At this time, members of the public may address the council regarding any items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the council cannot discuss or take action on any items not on the agenda unless authorized by law. Matters not on the agenda may, at the council's discretion, be returned to the city manager and placed on a future agenda. Those members of the public wishing to speak are asked to come forward to the microphone and state their name for the record. All speakers will be limited to a period of five minutes. Speakers must address their comments only to the mayor and entire city council, and not to any individual member of the staff or audience. Any documents for review should be presented to the city clerk for distribution. Do you have any public comments? Joyce Ross Parquet, Old Town resident. 50 years Old Town resident. I live here, I own my home. Um, at one of the meetings that you had local in the afternoon, I went to, well, when Sunset Aquatic Park came up, <clears throat> No one spoke about it. A Sunset Aquatic Park belongs to Seal Beach. I gave you, I, I made copies. And over there on the property was a place that should have been saved to build apartments. But now it's loaded with boat trailers when I took a look at it. You have to go down, if you're going down uh, to, to Surfside, 
you can look over to the left and you can see the property that belongs to Seal Beach. But there's someone from Huntington Beach that maintains the boats. Now, if the person lives on a boat, they should be paying taxes to the city. And those trailers belong where the, where the port, where the boat trailers are, that part belongs to the city and they should be paying for it. I gave you a copy. Of, it's an old copy. But that's the part that belongs to Seal Beach. And um, I see now on the agenda, they've taken the sewer line off the six, on 6th Street off the agenda. So we don't get a new sewer line, right? And um, then the other thing I want to talk about is the uh, the meeting also about Cal about the uh, retirement fund. That re retirement fund should have been refinanced about three years ago, like Huntington Beach did, because then you don't have to pay the high interest rate because it's getting huge. That retirement fund. You can't retire. You can't. You can't change it now from the interest rate because you didn't do it when Huntington Beach did, and that was like three years ago. And I came down here and suggested that you do it, but nobody did. So, and on a Friday, March seventeenth, there was a closed session at eleven thirty a.m. in the conference room, and it was uh, regarding. A police item. So I went down there and I stood from 11.15 to 11.30 and waited for the room to be opened up. The city manager came and said, just wait, we're going to, you know, changing the chairs and we'll get you in. So when 11.30 came, she did come out and said, it's time you can come in now. So I came in and I sat down and I think you all were there. She, she then invited me to leave. She invited me to leave the public hearing on the police department. So I got to thinking about that. Why would she invite me to leave when I am a, a legitimate taxpayer down here? Because I had told her her time was up to her time. She's been here too long. There's somebody local in this community that can take over this city and run it legitimately. Why are we broke? Now, the, the, two times she's mentioned that we're broke. Why are we broke? I only, I've only seen two houses that went into foreclosure. Why are we broke? We have brand new houses up on, seal, up on the beachfront. And I don't see anybody else moving out. They have to be paying their, in their taxes. And, and of all of our property taxes, you get 15%. So where's that money going? So I just wanted to discuss that because my time is not up yet. I'm here. I'll be coming back. It's her time. She's been here too long. And I don't understand how we can be broke. You have 30 seconds to wrap up. Thank you. Any other public comments? Okay, and City Attorney Gorelli, do you have anything to report? The City Council met in closed session to discuss the one item posted on the agenda. Um, all of the council was uh, present except for Council Member Landau and no uh, reportable action was taken. Okay, City Manager Ingram, do you have anything to report? I have no items to report tonight. However, you know, feel compelled to respond to the comment that was made just by stating in general city staff does not ask members of the public to leave a public meeting. Um, the meeting that was held on Friday, March 17th was a special meeting for a closed session. Um, as required with all public meetings, there was an opportunity for the speaker to speak during public comment before um, the council closed the door for uh, a meeting that's closed to the public. That's what a closed session means. So. Um, just wanted to state that for the public record. And if there's ever a question about that, they, you know, members of the public can also contact um, the clerk's office about what that process is. 
And that's all I have tonight. Thank you. It was published as a closed session meeting. That's um, correct. The move to council comments. Council member Landau. <clears throat> um, my, um, let's see. Um, one of the most sweet and sorrowful things I did recently was to attend the funeral, an amazing testament to the life of Robin Fort Link, our Seal, Seal Beach TV. Uh, it was a standing room only, and the love and admiration for her was overflowing. It was a beautiful combination of tears and laughter. Rest in peace, Robin. Also, thank you to the Chamber for another wonderful call show. The Chamber of Commerce, City, and Police Department worked really hard to welcome a large crowd to enjoy our town. Job well done. Uh, it's budget time, and every department has done a great job of helping us understanding the issues we face um, in two nights of budget workshops that we just attended. Uh, we have more work to do, and we always invite and ask the residents to come and be part of the process. Uh, part of my ongoing education on how our city works is touring each of the departments and experiencing the work that they do firsthand. Last week was a thorough tour of the beaches and lifeguard facilities. Thank you, Chief Joe. Um, it was wonderful. Next week will be a public works tour. It is eye-opening to see the extent of deferred maintenance and infrastructure needs our town has. I look forward to working with my colleagues and staff to prioritize and plan how to get our infrastructure up to date. Uh, also, congratulations to the Seal Beach Yacht Club on their 63rd opening day. It was an awesome ceremony. And then finally, um, please mark your calendar and plan to attend Neighbor for Neighbor Block Captain Meeting. It will be held Tuesday, May 30th at 6 p.m. at the Police Department. The Neighbor for Neighbor for program is the Seal Beach version of Neighborhood Watch, and is really important to, to keep our town keeping our town safe and prepared for emergencies. Uh, so please plan to come and be part of the solution, making us safer and resilient town. And for more information, you can go to the Seal Beach Police website and uh, go under Neighbor for Neighbor. Thank you. Thanks. Mayor Pro Tem Sistarsic. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I attended an OC Sanitation Board meeting and an OC Sanitation Operations Committee meeting. Uh, I uh, watched a Los Alrededos Los Cerritos Wetlands renovation meeting on Zoom uh, with uh, some of the recent plans for the uh, their redevelopment of the southern section, which is just north of the north of Gum Grove, uh, south of the Hellman property, so very close to us, which was very interesting to see their plans. I also attended a ceremony for uh, Robin Fort Leakey and uh, the car show. Uh, car show was a, a, a lovely day, lots of cars, a big crowd, uh, looked like the restaurants were all full and everyone uh, was having a good time and everybody was quiet and well behaved, it appeared to me, at least while I was there, so. Uh, thank you to that for that. I attended uh, two work two budget workshops and uh, a planning commission meeting uh, last week. So that's it for me. Thank you, okay. Councilmember Steele. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had a busy couple of weeks. I did uh, a sit-in at the Westcom call center for the 911 call center, and it was uh, eye-opening. It was It's amazing how uh, complete and comprehensive and competent that center is and how those uh, operators uh, work across desks when they have an emergency call on one side. The other desk is already pulling up rap sheets and and all kinds of information on, on the call going out. I was, I was overwhelmed, quite frankly. It was a very impressive a visit I had with them. I attended the West Orange County Water District uh, meeting with uh, uh, Director Iris Lee, and uh, it was very interesting to see that. Although brand new on that, I've had little or no in orientation, so I really can't comment quite yet. Uh, I sat in on the audit committee uh with our financial leadership team city manager ingram was there as well as a representative from poon group and we've seen that presentation now i had the opportunity to ask all kinds of penetrating questions that i could think of at the time and get a a, a deeper appreciation of what the auditing process actually entails and i was uh again duly impressed and i appreciate the time for that went to the opening of the classic car show for a couple hours couldn't stay all day but uh it was suitably impressed 
impressive. Uh, great city event. Uh, I, I've never seen that many great looking cars in one place at one time. And so, I mean, it was it was really cool. And then I, I spent that afternoon, that very afternoon, I was invited to, as we all were, to the, um, the 100th anniversary of the Ramona Bowl out in Hemet, California. I had a VIP uh, invitation, which I assumed involved food, other people, and air conditioning, which it did. That was all good, but it uh, the Ramona Bowl for me was something from my childhood. Uh, we lived in Hemet, California when I was a kid, and so Ramona Bowl's always had this kind of sweet spot in my heart. So I went out and watched the Ramona Bowl with my wife, and it was just it was suitably corny, uh, campy, and significant. It was really a great pageant of uh, cultures, and I really enjoyed that a lot. Um, we did the budget workshops as well i attended those um and also uh with uh marine uh chief uh bailey and the the tour of the beach that was very informative for me i've never seen it actually that up close and personal especially over on uh, surfside i guess and and the beach erosion that's going on over there so i look forward to when we get our shot at new sand for that particular piece of real estate and we got to go out in the boat and I got to see how that boat functions as a, as a, a life-saving vessel. Uh, although we didn't have to save any lives on this particular occasion, we did get a nice tour of the outside of um, Seal Beach, and that was very cool. I went to the SCAG conference last week out in Palm Desert. I enjoyed two days there. I'm not a representative on, on SCAG. Uh, uh, Councilman Kalmick is, and... Uh, but I did get to go to the symposiums. I attended a symposium on um, uh, equitable workforce and on housing. I found it highly informative and very um, educational. So as with most of these things, it's much bigger and more complex than it meets the, the eye when you're not, not on city council or in these organizations or speaking to experts. You come to find out that these housing issues, for example, are infinitely more complex than, uh, than meets the eye. So I learned a lot last week and I enjoyed it a great deal. So, and the weather did not cooperate. My wife did not get to sit by the pool in 100 degree weather. It only got to be like 63 degrees. So we were on one side, we were, uh, I, I learned a lot. On the other side, we were disappointed. So I hope to go back next year in the heat. The heat. Councilmember Kalmet. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with SCAG since uh, Councilmember Steele has mentioned it. Uh, I attended the conference uh, as I'm the, the voting uh, regional director for SCAG for our city, and uh, re which is called Region 20, um, Seal Beach, Los Alamitos, Westminster, and so forth. And so um, it's an amazing learning experience if you choose to make it so with the symposia that are available, um, even in the General Assembly, uh, the various speeches that are made, uh, they bring in people from outside of, of our structure. And uh, I'm hoping through actually just a couple of chance meetings uh, with people who were there, such as the head of the California Housing Community Development Department. We'll see if that bears any fruit. Um, I talked to some folks about regarding transportation and the possibility of, of finding grant money for what they call last mile transportation, which in our case would be the electric golf carts that we could hopefully integrate and be available so that uh, folks living all over Old Town and the Hill would be able to come downtown without impacting the parking and uh, be able to increase the circulation of parking and so forth downtown. And um, with regard to uh, pollution and the issues that we face in the San Gabriel River, um, I made a contact with, of all people, the Coca-Cola company, who uh, it turns out uh, the president of their California franchisee made a very nice um, keynote speech and was talking about Coca-Cola's interest in, in working on pollution problems. They themselves are converting all of their plastic bottles to clear so that they can be totally 100% uh, recycled. And as soon as I heard him mention removing plastics from the ocean, you know, I immediately went back outside to where all of the um, 
the sponsors of the SCAG event had booths and went up to the Coca-Cola booth and started a conversation with a uh, representative from corporate Coca-Cola. And as it turns out, they are involved with the um, what's called the Interceptor, which is currently being used um, in L.A. County at uh, Biona Creek. Whether something comes of it, I can't tell you, but it's certainly uh, something that I was going to try and take advantage of, and it might bear fruit, uh, you know, sometime down the road. So overall, the SCAG event, I think, was, was very worthwhile, and I'm glad that Councilmember Steele was able to go because it's another pair of eyes and so forth, and uh, to be able to, uh, you know, you always bring back something, and that's the hope. Um, I even hung out with my son, who was representing Huntington Beach, because he knows more people than I do. So uh, that worked out very well as well. So I also attended uh, the car show, which is, continues to be amazing. Um, it just keeps getting bigger and uh, more well attended. And as long as we can accommodate the cars, I think there were over 600 this year. You know, it's, it's just a great showcase for the city. Um, it helps our, our Main Street businesses, and it doesn't present any problems, which is somewhat unique in, in events that we, we hold in town over the years or have held in town. I also attended uh, uh, the Orange County Fire Authority Human Resources Committee, um, of which I'm chair, and where we discuss a lot of um, internal issues and so forth uh, at Orange County Fire. And um, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the Seal Beach Car Show was incredible this year. I congratulate the Chamber of Commerce on a wonderful job. Uh, I know there were over 600 cars, as mentioned, the most they've ever had, and the attendance was highest they've ever had. Uh, Tim Way, Gary Bean, and Diane Bean did a fabulous job coordinating things. Uh, the whole process was very pr impressive. From watching them guide all the cars in in the morning to the managing the judging process. Um, I was there all day. I ate the pancake breakfast and the hot dog lunch provided by the Seal Beach Lions and Leos. And I was honored to choose the Mayor's Choice Award, the El Dorado 1957 Cadillac. And uh, I was also invited by Councilmember Landau to attend the Seal Beach Yacht Club opening day. It was also an honor to be there and present them with a plaque from the city of Seal Beach with Councilmember Landau. I, did, I didn't realize so many people from the Seal Beach Lions and uh, are also members of the Seal Beach Yacht Club. And I didn't realize uh, Councilmember Landau was a member until last week. They're a fun group and very patriotic people, and they look like they have a lot of fun sailing as well. I look forward to going to a few future events. I attended the two budget public meet hearings, and uh, one of the one of the operational budget on May first and the CIP on May second, and the financial director and each department in the city did a great job presenting, and also gave us a reality check on the upcoming years. Uh, for the budget meetings. I know it was a little shocked to look at the five-year forecast, so I'd like to ask the city to arrange one more budget meeting to discuss the five-year forecast, uh, discussing how we can keep the budget balanced as we move forward in future years, and also discuss pre-allocated accounts like that we have for the pool and the pier. And I think we need this prior to adopting the budget this year. So I'd just like to ask the city to come back and schedule a meeting before we adopt the budget. Yes, we can do that. I just want to clarify, um, based on our discussion um, following the, the last two budget workshop sessions, um, we finalized those numbers because obviously our budget's balanced. Um, so we've moved forward with um, noticing public hearing for May 22nd. Um, so if the intent is basically to schedule a third um, budget study session prior to May 22nd, then we can work with um, the five of you and try to coordinate a date um, that works for you. Um, obviously, as we talked about, the five-year forecast is just that. It's a forecast based on the assumptions we know right now, um, clearly understanding that that's fluid and it's going to continue to move. But we're happy to, to have another study session to go through that again if you'd like to do that. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. And that's all I have for comments. Um, 
Council items are none. A consent calendar. Items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and are enacted by a single motion with the exception of items removed. Uh, I'd like to call for a motion to approve the consent calendar. I move. Oh, yeah. See? There you go. I'll second. Please vote on the iPads. Okay, motion carries 5 0. There's no public hearings. There's no unfinished business. We have one new business, item F, consideration of ordinance 1704 to add chapter 7.65 to the Seal Beach Munis Municipal Code to regulate operation of e bikes and other regulated mobile devices on public areas. And I'll call upon Captain Mike Ezra. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, City Manager, City Staff. I'll try to make this as brief as possible and not as technical as it is. We found with e-bikes, uh, progress and technology is going way faster than the state can keep up in regulating it. Uh, but also, why not May to present this? Because May is Bicycle Safety Month, as recognized in the state of California. With that, if we can move on to the next slide. The proposed ordinance offers an opportunity for regulation of motility devices, enforcement, and there are some exceptions. The biggest draw, if you can go back, we're not there yet. Thank you though. The biggest draw to this ordinance, it allows law enforcement to have some discretion into what due operation with due care and reduced speed is to people on e-bikes. All bicycles have to obey rules of the road. That's for a pedal driven and an e-bike motor driven bicycle. However, there's some gray areas and rules of the road and safe operation. This ordinance will allow law enforcement the ability to address those gray areas. And instead of finding children or finding adults that are riding it, it will give them an opportunity to educate them. The goal of our department is to educate and then enforce, and this ordinance allows that. The best example I can provide is a 13-year-old who's on an e-bike that turns out to actually be a motor-driven bicycle because the wattage are much higher than what the state allows. It's not their fault, it's something they convinced their parents to purchase. This ordinance will allow us to contact that juvenile, contact that parent, have them attend a public safety course or class at our police department, and then learn, oh yeah, the e-bike that I purchased for my son or daughter is actually considered a motorcycle and requires a license, a different helmet, registration, mirrors, all sorts of different lights and wazoo things that's mandated by the vehicle code. Uh, if you can go to the next slide now, thank you. California does define an e-bike, the sections up there, and they define them into three different classes. You can see uh, class one is a pedal assist e-bike, and it can exceed 20 miles per hour, and there's no throttle on it, which means they need to pedal it, and once they pedal, the motor kicks in, and it kind of goes, and it goes with them as they pedal, making it easier. A class two is pedal assist, can exceed 20 miles per hour, but also has a throttle, so once you start riding, you can stop riding, and then you can use the throttle to regulate your speed, not to exceed 20 miles per hour. And while class three, uh, depending on which one you buy, some have throttles, some don't, but that can exceed 28 miles per hour. Anything that exceeds 28 miles per hour is no longer an e-bike and it gets into the vehicle code of a motor driven bicycle, a moped, and what we're seeing now are just basically e-motorcycles that some of the kids are riding around the area. If you can go to the next one, you can see Here's another explanation of the classes. And if you can see, this one offers a little more explanation on the third class, where at the end it says it's equipped with a speedometer. So if we come across an e-bike that doesn't have a speedometer, most of the kids are saying, no, no, it's a class two. However, when we look up online the name and the brand, it's actually a thousand watts, which doesn't even make it a class three, and now makes it into a motor-driven bicycle, which isn't addressed on e-bikes. We can go to the next slide, Chief. Finally, here's another explanation of it. Again, I hope it's not too confusing. Uh, the key to this one, helmet requirement, anyone under the age of 18 on all of them. And helmets recommended on all ages for them. Because again, you're operating, in essence, a bike that has a motor that's going 20 to 25 miles per hour, any type of impact to the ground is gonna be significant and or into an object. If you can go to the next slide, sir. 
again, I spoke earlier, the point of having this is for the education aspect and then to, and to enforce. Uh, we have been approached by residents. I've asked, hey, what are you doing about these kids? It's the same kid, multiple offender type situation. For us, we'd like to see that child and their parent or that adult on the e-bike attend our safety course so we can explain the regulation to them. And then upon the second contact, that's when we can cite for the municipal code and it can go before the judge in court where the judge can assess the penalty. We don't have a say per se in the penalty. However, if it's a third, fourth, fifth offense, we can bring that up to the judge's attention or the commissioner's attention and they can then impose different rules and regulations on how they wanna either punitive damage the person or regulate how they're operating the bike within our community. Uh, most importantly, e-bikes, as I mentioned before, some of them that exceed the 750 watts are subject to being impounded just like a vehicle. So that is a tool that we can have if it's a multiple offense and it's someone that's on an e-bike that exceeds 750 watts, which now makes it a motor-driven bicycle or a moped or a motorcycle, uh, we have the ability to tow it just like we would any car. And then the serial number on the e-bike would actually be the VIN number for it. And then we'd fill out our standard paperwork We'd call a tow truck, they'd come take it up, they'll take it to our contracted tow yard. The subject riding it will have to come with the licensed driver to come pay the fees at the police department and then go pick up their vehicle and sense from the tow yard. So there are ways for multiple offenders to be punitively damaged and understand that what they're riding may not be a bicycle per se, but it's more of a motored vehicle on our roadways and they need to operate safely and with due manner. Other cities that have adopted similar regulations are up here again the e-bike craze is growing way faster than the state and cities can keep up each day there's a new vendor each day we're coming across new brands of bikes the one thing we are seeing that's universal are in the manufacturers their booklets on how to operate at the very end it normally ends with a kind of standard segment of saying please defer to your state and or city regulations for the classification of bike and if it can be operated within that city and for us, that's their disclaimer saying, hey, you've bought this. However, we're not liable if it's something that you can't ride in your city or in your state. A lot of success has been driving this municipal code has been the city of Carlsbad. They have several high schools and they reported back in 2001 into 2002, approximately a thousand e-bikes at each of their high school. So they were just inundated and had no way of responding to it. And they implemented a code similar to this, which allowed them to go then start enforcing it and they were getting the kids into the class that were going to this high school on these e-bikes that were motorcycles and explain to the parents what you've purchased is in fact a motorcycle, it's not a bike. And they saw a great success in the reduction of those classifications of bikes out on the roads, those classification of bikes going to and from schools and in turn reduce the amount of complaints that residents were seeing and a lot of issues that they had just through the education portion of a municipal code like this. You know, next slide. With that, so a real brief summary of e-bikes. It's very, it gets very technical as you get into it. I'll address any questions if there are. Any questions? Councilmember Kelman. Yeah, um, I, I would just like to uh, point out one thing that I think certainly the younger kids that are riding e-bikes and um, probably a great number of adults don't realize that an electric motor reaches 100% of its torque the minute you activate the throttle and so i think you know I, I read letters where people are complaining on next door people complaining about the e-bikes and saying i saw one going 40 miles an hour well it's not they're not going 40 miles an hour the most they can go is 28 unless they've learned how to tweak the controller but the main point is is that they dart very quickly because of that incredible acceleration from a standing start and we see them here especially you know darting out of the alleys or darting back and forth and uh, you know i think that's even could be the biggest problem that we have is the darting behavior yeah and the darting behavior just like any vehicle a bicycle needs to have due regard to safety of other vehicles on the roadway so they need to yield the right away they can't just dart out of an alleyway onto ocean or onto any of the side streets and same with the stop signs they need to stop at all the stop signs and this will allow us if a 13 year old is on a class one or two bicycle and they run through two or three stop signs like they're prone to do, it will allow us the opportunity to get them into our class and educate them on the rules of the road, which is something 
they may not have learned because there would be no expectation that a 13 year old would understand short of parents telling them there's no classes that they would attend short of the class that we would offer them. And a lot of issues that we see, they're not so much the speed of it, it's just the people operating them not knowing what they have. They'll, they'll turn around and say, no, the spike is 750 watts, I'm fine. And you look up online real quick or they'll have the manual with it and it has what's called peak performance. And that peak performance is at 1350 watts, which now makes it a roughly about 150 cc motorcycle on the roadway. So it's no longer an e-bike and it's trying to explain <clears throat> to them, hey, what you purchase is actually an electric motorcycle. And they'll come back, no, we put a governor on it. Just because you modify it to make it less doesn't change what it actually is on the roadway. And in the case of the, the older teenagers, the 25 to 35 group that um, actually use it as motorcycles and go out and, especially when the berms were up, were jumping the berms just like they were, you know, on a motocross bike. Yeah, and this is a section that will allow us to get a hold of them, for lack of a better term, to get them into a class that, hey, this isn't acceptable. You can't be out there on any motor vehicle on the beach unless you're a lifeguard or police trying to be lifeguards. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Councilmember Steele. I'm sorry. Did you want to... uh, I'm glad we're getting a, a handle on this, to be honest with you. The, it's a good thing e-bikes weren't around when I was a kid. Uh, I mean, kids are kids, and these are cool, and we live in a free country, and, and they should be able to, you know, go where and do and and have fun take the risk of doing it just like on a normal bike people people get killed on normal bikes too so um, but i'm glad we're putting something in place that will require them or encourage them to get an education on this stuff because when these kids and I, this has happened to me and some of my neighbors when the kids are up on those bikes they're more interested in making a jump off the curb or 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 that darting thing that uh, and so i mean it's it's a thrill for them to be doing this stuff and uh, and they're not thinking about traffic. I had one jump out in front of me uh, just over here in the a uh, uh, few weeks ago. Scared me to death, you know. And it's it made my heart pound faster than it probably should at my age. But nonetheless, I'm glad we're getting a handle on it. Uh, and I hope no kids get seriously hurt uh, on these things. But I think we ought to, you know, it's a free country. If they want to go off and jumps over in Gum Park, you know, they should be able to. Uh, do stuff like that too so can they still do jumps in gum park on on they're not supposed to no oh okay well, then, <laughs> forget i said that <laughs> councilman orlando oh go ahead shelly oh go ahead i'm i was going to get down into the nets and bolts of the ordinance oh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um so is there a minimum age because um where i live out on the hill i especially see a lot of especially little girls um is there an age where they're absolutely not allowed to ride? For a class one and two, there's none. For a class three, they have to be 16 or older. And then anything that exceeds the class three modifications, they have to be 16 older with a valid license and all DOT approved safety equipment on. Okay, <clears throat> and then what about double riders? That's a, that's a great question, thank you. Some of the bikes are equipped for double riders, but most of them aren't. Uh, the, if it's a double rider, there needs to be a place for them to be able to, the second rider to place their feet. They can't just stick off to the side. So it's normally getting some extra pegs or footboards for them to put it on. Most recently on the hill, just last week, we had uh, three girls that all tried to cram on one. None of them had shoes, none of them had their feet down, and only one of the three had a helmet. And we stopped them and they're floored like, what was wrong? <laughs> and we went in trying to explain the dangers and all that stuff. So the two of them got off and the one then just made a left in front of traffic and went up the hill to our house. And we're like, oh, it's, it's a slow process, but we're slowly getting people's compliance. Um, yeah, I am glad you guys are getting a handle on this. Um, okay, so the, uh, the last two nights in a row, um, I was driving um, down Crestview and it was just had gotten dark and um, there was e-bikes being ridden fast and uh, in the dark, and, and neither one of them had headlights. And um, I think if I would have been a distracted driver, I could have easily hit them. Are, are they allowed to drive these at night? Or if they are, I mean, don't bicycles have to have a headlight at night? That's correct. They are required to have headlights and taillights, just like a bicycle. 
And I'd say the majority of the e-bikes that are sold here in California do comply to that. However, like I said, the progress and the companies that are making them, producing them, it changes almost daily with new and new companies that require our end of the research to figure out, hey, the, last week the trend was Super 73s, now it's Ciron bikes, and now we're waiting to see what this next week's gonna hold in regard to the regulations. And it's trying to nab those people when they're out and about to let them know, hey, you need a white light to the front, a red light to the back, and even as far as if it becomes a moped and a motorcycle, you need turn signals, you need mirrors, and it's, it's the education of what the parents have bought their kids or what, someone bought thinking it was a class one or two when it turns out it's actually a moped. Okay, I just have one more question. Um, um, so, okay, so when um, these kids um, keep doing what they're doing and now you're able to give them citations after they've done a class uh, or even before that, um, so if they get a citation and they get to do uh, the class in lieu of, I guess, getting going to court, um, do they have to stay off their bike until they take this training class or um there's no way for us to really stop them from riding their bike short of us like if we were to impound it because it turned out to be a different classification our, our plan is to get a handful of kids which i don't think are people that won't be too difficult to get within a week's time span to get them into these courses and have them every other week or so uh fortunate for us with our dispatch and our records keeping we will be able to know, hey, have we contacted this subject before? And if it's something that they haven't attended the class yet, and it's their second violation, that's something we can start issuing the citation for and uh, trying to explain to them and the parents, look, by the time this class comes up, you're gonna have four or five offenses. We're looking at more than just our class to resolve it. It's gonna be, you're gonna need to attend our class and then you're gonna have to go to court for these other citations. And that's where we can sit before a judge or commissioner and explain clearly it's not working versus a fine, do you think it's possible to impose community service? And that will be up to the courts to decide on how they wanna proceed once it's in their jurisdiction. The class just allows us the opportunity to not have the 13, 14, 15 year old, or even the 20 year old that just didn't know better suffer the court consequences. It gives them basically a second chance to get out there and follow the regulations and be a safe rider. Okay, and oh, I have one more question. Oh. Um, so do you, um, do you encourage the public? I, I mean, cause again, there's some kids that are just really, really, um, dangerous out there, not only to themselves, but to the, the other residents, um, instead of posting on next door and complaining there, do you encourage them to call, um, the non-emergency number and, you know, if they're out and they're doing the darting practice or there's kids riding around or people are out with no lights, a hundred percent, I encourage them to call our non-emergency emergency line to let us know so we can get officers out there. It's more than just a public safety at that point, it turns into their own personal safety and it's something we like to hedge off before it becomes something more serious, like a collision or someone getting seriously hurt as a result of poor operation of the e-bike. Okay, well thank you. Um Captain Ezra and Chief Henderson and the rest of the PD for taking action to help ensure that uh, the safety of our residents and especially our kids. And I'm glad that we're being proactive now instead of reacting to a tragedy. So thank you. Okay, Mayor Pertemps is our sick. Thank you. Uh, I was, I was, had some questions on the, the ordinance. Uh, it, it, if I'm reading it right, it describes um, the regulated motility vices all all sort of grouped together. So that means whatever applies to bicycles or whatever applies to everything, or I, I, I'm not sure when it's restricting things here. For us, and I'll, I'll, I'll just add that, yes, regulated mobility by device, it includes more than just yeah, an e-bike it also includes you know scooters and things like that yeah uh, th which is uh, and I, I had a question I, it, basically it said you know them off the sidewalks which i think is already pretty much a rule in seal beach uh, up in college park east we have some restrictions and and i'm not so concerned about the sidewalks in college park east because they go like this all the time and i don't think anybody really rides on them. But on the uh, south side of Lamson, we have a wide sidewalk, which is allowed to have bicycles mm -hmm. on it. And I, I mean, I agree that pedestrians are, are most important, uh, but uh, Lamson is still 
a scary place for people to send their kids on. And I was also had a question about the mobility scooters because they come over the bridge uh, from Leisure World to go up to the shopping centers. And, and we, you know, somebody like that could ride that sidewalk to go over to take the path behind the trees up to Old Ranch Town or whatever. So I was trying to decide if this would restrict those uses on, this, on that particular sidewalk in, or could you just r limit e-bikes? Uh, anyway, I was trying to make sure we didn't have a situation where we, we would put us kind of isolated since we can't really use the back door into any shopping center. We have to go out onto Lamson, so. Yeah, the, the idea is not to isolate you guys or people on other mobility devices don't have the same capabilities as what these e-bikes operate and the municipal code talks about operating with due regard for public safety and at a safe speed, which most of the mobility devices outside of e-bikes, which would be the assistant scooters and those type of things that you'd see generally in that area, wouldn't be operating at a speed exceeding normally five to eight miles per hour. So in, in our realm, that's operating in due regard for public safety because they're not exceeding the speed limit okay. versus the e-bike that's zipping up the, over the overpass at 45 miles per hour because they're rushing to get back into Rossmore and they're zooming past the other people on mobility devices, that would be the subject we want to talk to okay. and explain to them, no, this is acceptable. You need to be on the right side of the road. And So it wouldn't be changing the ability of the, the slower devices to use that particular sidewalk? No, because they're operating with due regard and due regard. Okay. public safety. Because they to, could you know, always get off if a pedestrian scene. They could also, I, I thought the rules for the trails were were reasonable and I, I suppose that's the bike trail that that would apply to or those are the bike trails and it's actually mentioned in the vehicle code for e-bikes that they're supposed to dismount if pedestrians are within a 50 mount 50 feet or so to make it safe passage okay let's see if i have any other i'm just trying to remember and, and just to clarify that oh. the ordinance does state that uh riding one of these regulated mobility devices is prohibited in public areas, but only in public areas where there's a sign posted saying that it's restricted. Okay, so if there's a sign saying it's allowed, but it's saying that bicycles are allowed, but that, uh, that right presently that's saying that bicycles are allowed, but that wouldn't let e-bikes ride there or because it wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily be safe is what I'm saying. And so I think that Captain, as we didn't want to create a, you know, hard prohibition in here, not realizing which public areas might be acceptable and which weren't. And so I think Captain Ezra, uh, together with Chief Henderson, are going to have to look at or maybe individual situations sign like this. sign added or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, that, that was just my concern. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think this is a great uh, effort, to, especially... Is this all the changes in the past three or four years with e-bikes and we all see them in our neighborhood riding around and that you can see it's a danger so thanks for putting this together no problem and i also like the approach and how you're educating uh the kids first thanks thank you We'll move to adjourn, adjourn the city council to Monday, May 22nd. Oh, before we adjourn, we uh, do need to take a motion on the oh, ordinance. I'm sorry. Introduce it. <laughs> there any uh, call for a motion? I'm, I'm out of it now. Somebody over there do it. Yeah. Somebody. I did. <laughs> I did. Oh, she's here. Hit the button okay. on your screen. Okay. It's oh. up there. Is there a second? Go. I'll second. Please vote. That's the way you do business here. <laughs> and I'll go ahead and read the title. And it's an ordinance of the city of Seal Beach adding chapter 7.65, operation of regulated mobility devices to the Seal, Seal Beach Municipal Code to regulate the use of mobility devices in the city and finding the ordinance to be exempt from review under the California Environmental Quality Act. Thank you. Now we'll adjourn. Adjourn the city council to Monday, May 22nd, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. to meet in closed session if deemed necessary. Thank you. <laughs>